I'm not all polished up. I got a few scriptures here, but really it's just going to be uh, just what's been a burden on my heart, especially when it comes to the gospel. I've loved the gospel so much. Uh, Romans 116, something we stand by all the time is that it is the gospel that is the power of God into salvation. And I don't see it shared enough or I see it being twisted or it's just not elaborated enough. Maybe they'll do a half a gospel Maybe just the bad news and never the good news. Or sometimes it's just all good news and never the bad news. There has to be a... It has to be both. You have to know both of these things. And sometimes when I hear people, you know, come against faith alone, come against, you know, what the Bible says, how to be saved, a lot of people will say, no, it's not like this, it's like this, it's like this. So when you ask people, well, how do you get saved? They'll give you a list of what you have to do. And it all basically comes down to these words. Try your best. Try your best to be a good person and the Lord will see that you're trying and he will, uh, he'll have mercy on you. But you have to try your best. You have to do these things. And it gets, now that could either come into uh, two different ways. Either, either the person will end up being self-righteous and thinking that, well, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm not like this guy. I don't sin like this guy. Or it could cause someone who was like me who says, I have nothing. Whatever I do isn't right. I, could ne I can't. My best is not good enough. And I think that's the attitude that the bad news has to bring in the, in the gospel of Jesus. So when we hear that you just got to try your best, just try your best and God will see. That's, uh, that's not what the Bible talks about. That's not the gospel. The, the gospel doesn't say try your best. It doesn't say that. So if you could find that in scripture, let me know. But that's what I basically heard my whole life. Try your best. Keep doing it. Keep trying. Keep trying. And, you know, maybe God will, will save you. So, um... Hold on a minute. Okay. So I want to look at that tonight from God's perspective. When we say try your best, what does that say about God? You know what I mean? Uh, like I said, I'm not polished up. I, I barely, ha I have a few scriptures and I'm literally just going right now because it's just something that was just uh, burning on my heart today. From the things that I hear and that word really bothers me try your best because we know what our best is filthy rags there is no one good so when when people say try your best on God's point of view people have to know who God is when we say that do we know what we're saying about God because as the Bible says look at what it says here first Samuel 2 2 there is none holy like the Lord there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Amen. So I think a lot of people tend to forget or maybe not know enough that God is holy. He is holy. He's, uh, the Bible teaches that God is the holy one. The idea, holiness basically means that he is separate. He's separate from sin and ugliness. <laughs> that he has no tolerance for sin. Uh, Psalms 5.4 says, You are a God who takes no pleasure in evil. With you, wickedness cannot dwell. So God cannot look upon sin and tolerate it. So when people say, try your best, it's making it seem like God is, is not that holy, that he could see, well, at least you're trying. No, God is holy. And he demands perfection. Uh, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Because God is holy, he is unable to look at sin. It says, But your iniquities have separated you, you and your God, and your sins, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear you. Havakah 
113 says, Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So when we say, or when we hear, just try your best. Well, no, God is saying that he's holy. The best that we could do is not good enough because he's holy. We have to understand that he is holy. See, unless we understand who God is, we will not understand salvation. We won't understand all of these doctrines, imputed righteousness, all of the doctrines. We will never be able to understand them unless we know who God is, who we're dealing with, and who we are. Jeremiah 9.23 says, Let not the wise boast in their wisdom or the, the strong in their strength. But let the one who boasts, boast in this, that they know and understand me, that he's a God that loves to show righteousness and justice. He's saying, don't boast that you're wise, but boast in the fact that you know me. And I think a lack of understanding of the attributes of God comes up with these phrases, try your best, and all of these things that we hear where it makes someone say, well, either they're self-righteous where I'm better than this guy because I'm doing this and I gave up this sin, or it's going to produce, like I said earlier, someone who will never be able to be saved. You come to the point where just try your best. Okay, let me not sin. Let me not do this. Let me try to do these works. And then you come to a point when you read these scriptures that God is, God is so holy that even when we think something, if we committed uh, if we hate our brother, we commit murder in our heart. If I think something sinful, I, I committed murder. You know what I mean? So you get to the point where I'm just trying, I'm striving, I'm doing, and I, I can't make it. And it makes you stumble and it actually makes you, you know, not want to come to God because I'm a sinner and I messed up. There's no way I could come to him. It reminds me of how much Jesus... Amen. So since God is holy and righteous, he demands holiness and righteousness. Amen. So this is why I'm saying we need to understand that God is holy and he demands perfection. When someone says, just try your best. No, God is demanding perfection. Look at what it says, Matthew 5, 48. You, this is Jesus talking. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.40 says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So look at what he's saying. Jesus is not saying, try your best. Uh, just keep striving. Just keep doing it. Try your best and maybe it'll work out. No, Jesus is actually raising the bar. And he's saying, no, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Your righteousness has to go surpass the scribes and the Pharisees. And who was more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees? No one. These people devoted their life. Even they added more to the law so that they would keep it. And they became the self-righteous ones. So see how it produces the self-righteous people? But Jesus is raising the bar now. He's saying, your righteousness must surpass those of the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't say, try your best like we're, we're hearing today. Try your best and maybe it'll work out. No, he's saying, no, you must surpass them. You have to be better than them. Your righteousness has to be perfect. God is demanding perfection. Look at Proverbs 11, verse 4. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. So since God, oh no, I'm freezing again. Is it freezing still? Okay. Uh, where was I? 
Okay. So riches do not profit on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Amen. So God is raising the bar. And this should cause us to realize, oh no, I'm doomed. I have no righteousness. Uh, man is not righteous. Micah 7 verse 2. There is no one upright among mankind. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Proverbs 21 verse 10 The soul of the wicked desires evil. Look at that. So Jesus is demanding not try your best. Try your best. It'll work out. Jesus is demanding perfection. You, you must be perfect. you you must be holy because I am holy. God cannot demand anything less than perfection. Look at what it says in Job 15, uh, I believe 16. It says, God puts no trust in his holy ones and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is an abom abomination and corrupt, a man who drinks down iniquity as if it was water. God bless you, Crystal. So you see here what's happening? God is not saying, again, try your best, it'll work out. Jesus is saying, no, you must be perfect. God, since he's holy, demands perfection because he's holy. If he demands anything less, then he's no longer perfect, he's no longer righteous. God has to demand perfection because he himself is holy. This is why we need to study and know the attributes of God like his holiness his wrath, his justice, his righteousness. If we understand who God is, we could better understand that salvation has to be a gift from God. It has to be. If not, we're all doomed. So if the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less is a man who is a corrupt? Later on in Job, it calls man maggots. Graza maggots. So if the highest heavens and the holy ones are not, uh, the angels are not pure in his sight, how much more? So this brings us to a problem. If God is demanding, not try your best and it'll work out. But if he is demanding perfection, we have to look at ourselves and say, I am not perfect. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm not perfect, you know, but I'm not that bad. Well, not only does the Bible say you're not perfect, but the Bible says no one is good. No, not one. So if we're depending on ourselves to be saved, depending on our righteousness, we have no righteousness. If we're depending on ourselves, we will never be saved. Jeremiah 17 verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who puts trust in man and makes flesh his strength, those hearts whose hearts turns away from the Lord. Proverbs 15, verse 8, the sacrifices of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Look at that. If we are, are, if what we're depending on, our righteousness, our sacrifices, God is saying that's still not good enough. You need to be perfect. Your sacrifices, your trusting in your strength and what you could do, it's not enough. God demands perfection, not Try your best. Hopefully it'll work out. Isaiah 64 verse 6. All, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are filthy rags or a polluted garment. So when people say, you know, the best, the, the way to be saved is just for you to try your best. Our best our best is filthy rags, graza, in front of God. The Bible says that we are unclean. The book of Job says, can anything clean come out of something that is unclean? So if we ourselves are unclean because of sin and our sinful nature, whatever works we do do and depend on that, well, maybe that'll get me into heaven. Our graza and our sin comes through and our works are now tainted by sin. And if we're going to bring that in front of God and say, this should be enough. Here's my best. God is going to say, didn't I say I demand perfection? I demand holiness. 
away. I don't want that. That's not good enough. You need righteousness. So this brings us to a dilemma. Job says it himself. How could man be made right in front of God? If God is demanding perfection and we have nothing but filthy rags, we have nothing but polluted garments, uh, the sacrifices that we would do is an abomination to God. We can't trust in our strength. We can't trust in anything we do because it's tainted by sin. Who then could do this? Who then could be saved? Who is one who is righteous? We know Romans chapter 3 says there is no one who is righteous, not even one. So if all these billions of people on earth, there's billions and billions of people on earth, the Bible goes far as to say there's not one who does good and does not sin. All are sinners. There is no one to account for righteousness. There's not a single person on earth who never sinned and does good. This is horrible news. So this should cause us to realize who then could satisfy this demand. If God is demanding perfection, not our best, not try your best because that ain't going to work. Our best is filthy rags. So who could satisfy God's demand of righteousness? And the answer, as you girls all should know, is that there is only one who is righteous. And it was Jesus. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. First John 2 says that he, that he is the advocate, the righteous, the righteous one. Jesus was born perfectly holy without a sinful nature. In Luke 135, it says, And the angel answered her, Mary, and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born shall be called holy, the son of God. Look at that. From birth, he's not even born yet. And the angel's already saying, he's the holy one. Here's the one who is to be holy. No one else is holy, but he is holy. Now look at, in Psalms 51, it says that we were all born into sin. In sin did my mother conceive me, David is saying. But Jesus, in the womb, he is called holy. He doesn't have a sinful nature like me, like you. He truly is the holy one of God. Amen. So it was necessary for Jesus to be fully man, for him to be under the law. Now, Jesus, he didn't have the sinful nature. That line skipped. He didn't go through like what we, are, what we go through how we're born into sin. But Jesus, he was conceived through the Holy Spirit and he is called the Holy One. But he still, he has, a, he's fully man. So it was necessary for Jesus to be fully man, to be born under the law and to fulfill it on our behalf. Galatians, <coughs> Galatians 4, verse 4 through 5 says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Amen. So not only does Jesus come to die, if we was to ask anybody, what did Jesus come to do on earth? To die, to heal people, to do. But I think we tend to forget or not maybe emphasize so much on the fact that Jesus lived the perfect life that God demanded. Your righteousness must surpass those of the scribes and Pharisees. You must be perfect. We need righteousness. Christ, yes, he comes to take away the sin problem that we have, but also he came to live a perfect life that you and I could never live. Jesus didn't have to try and strive like we do because he doesn't have a sinful nature. He, there's no struggle with sin. Me and you struggle with sin all the time. But since Jesus came without a sinful nature, without the being conceived in sin, he, has, he doesn't have that struggle. <clears throat> so he was born perfectly holy. And he comes and he's born under the law. And he kept every single one of those laws. He came to live a perfect and sinless life. Amen. God bless you, Crystal. Uh, 
April, God bless you girls. So not only does he come to die on our behalf, but he also comes to live on our behalf. Look at how amazing that is. He comes to live on our behalf. And he never sinned. 1 Peter 2.22, it says, He committed no sin, neither was there any deceit found in his mouth. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who does not sympathize with our weaknesses, but the one who, but one who has been tempted in all ways, yet without sin. 1 John 3.15 says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 1 Peter 1.19, the blood, it talks about the blood of Jesus, was unblemished and spotless. Look at how perfect he is. So do you girls see the connection how God is demanding perfection? We have no perfection. We're not perfect. We're not good. But we're just full of wickedness and sin. We drink iniquity down if it, like if it was water. But yet the one who is righteous is Jesus, his son. It goes, it, it says the blood of Jesus was unblemished and it was spotless. Glory goes to God. So not only does, is he not sinless, but he is perfectly righteous. First John calls him the righteous advocate. Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them. Amen. Uh, Matthew 3.15 talks about the baptism of Jesus and how he goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And he, John the Baptist is telling him, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? You baptize me. And Jesus says this in John 3, 15, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 3.15. Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Amen. So look at that. Jesus, when he was here on earth, he kept the law perfectly. The greatest commandment is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus did that every second of his life, 33 years on earth, there wasn't a time that Jesus wasn't loving the, love, uh, loving the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. We as sinners can never do that. We never love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We could say we do, but really we don't. There was only one who did that. And because of this, he is righteous and he fulfilled the law and he did what was pleasing to the Father. So even in the baptism of Jesus, he was obedient. The Bible says in, I believe it's Philippians 2, that he was obedient even to the point of death, death on the cross, that there was no deceit in his mouth. He never had a bad thought, a bad word, uh, anything come out of his mouth. There was no deceit in his mouth. But he always did what pleased the Father. Amen. John eight thirty. Uh, no, John eight twenty nine. it says, For I always do the things that please him. Look at that. Jesus is saying, I always do what is pleasing to the Father. God, the Father, says at the baptism of Jesus and at the Mount of Transfiguration twice, he says, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. That is amazing that God, he said, he, he gives the statements all throughout the Bible that he's holy, that he's righteous, that, that no one could uh, see him and live. There's times in the Bible where he sent fire down from heaven for those who disobeyed him. He killed a man for picking up uh, sticks on the Sabbath. He killed Uzzah for touching the ark because it was about to fall down on the floor because these people disobeyed God. So God being holy and righteous, a sinner can't just come to him. It has to, you know, Jesus, how can I say this? <laughs> Jesus, the perfect one, always did what was pleasing to the Father. He says, I am pleased with him. Amen. 
So that's amazing to know that God the Father is saying about Jesus, who is perfectly righteous, never knows sin. He could say of Jesus, I am well pleased with him. And he could even tell the disciples, listen to him. It's amazing. Glory goes to God. So John 8, 29. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John 4, 34 says, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Look at how amazing that is. Jesus saying, it's my food, it's my pleasure, it's my satisfaction to please the Father. Glory goes to God. So everything, everything that we just read about how God is holy, how he demands perfection, you don't see nowhere in the Bible that he says, just try your best. Try your best and hopefully it'll work out. You have to live this life. You have to try your best. Keep striving. It'll work out. No, the bar is raised and he demands perfection because he himself is perfect. He can't demand anything less of who he is. In First or Second Timothy, it says that he cannot deny himself. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah it says that he has to avenge his name in the book of uh, Leviticus chapter 10 after he killed Adab and Abihu who offered up strange fire that they offered up this incense to the Lord and God did not permit them he didn't want that worship and when they did that he killed them right there and after that was done he told Moses he said uh, I will be proven holy I will make it known among the world that I am holy and I am to be feared. I am to be reverenced. I am to be holy. So God cannot say, oh, you're trying your best. All right, that's good enough. Heidi. No, he says, no, I demand perfection, righteousness, since he's holy. So Christ, who is not only sinless, but he also lives the perfect life. See, we could never achieve this perfect life. I wish we could, but Christ is the one who did it. If we could achieve this perfect life, life, then Christ died in vain, as Galatians says. So Jesus, not only does he come to die on the cross, but he also comes to fulfill righteousness, to live the perfect life. And he did it. Amen. So everything in the Bible was leading up to Christ. The sacrifices in the temple, having to offer sacrifices every year on the Day of Atonement, a sacrifice for this, sacrifice for that. It had to be a certain animal. Everything was a foreshadow of the better things that was to come, and that better thing was Jesus Christ. Jesus says it himself in John chapter 5, verse 39. It says, search the scriptures, for in them... You search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, but they are what testify about me. So Jesus himself is saying, everything you know, he's telling these scribes and Pharisees, everything you think you know, you're missing it, because everything is testifying about me, that I'm the righteous one, that I'm the one who will be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. I will be the better high priest. I will have the the perfect life that you need. Romans 8 verse 3. <clears throat> Romans 8 verse 3 through 4 says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit so look at that all of the ten the ten commandments the law of god the sacrificial system all of that was just a picture for us to see and for those people at that time to see that we cannot do it on our own jesus says it himself these are all testifying about me Th those things are meant to show you that you need a savior that man is not the savior, that a bull and a lamb is not what's going to save people, but it's a perfect righteousness and a sinless life is what could, is what going to save. So again, Romans 8 says, God done 
what the law, weakened by the flesh, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Could not do it. The Bible says that the law was our schoolmaster or our tutor to bring us to Christ. Uh, I, f- I think it's Romans, I forget where it's at, Romans 3.19 says that the law was given in order to stop every man from boasting and so that all could be held accountable to God. You see, because it's easy for us to look at the next person and say, I'm not that bad as this guy and we could compare ourselves to other people and in front of that person we could be good and hey, our righteousness might just be good enough because we're comparing ourselves to other people. But God is not comparing us to the next guy. He's comparing us to his self. So once we compare ourselves to God, we're like Isaiah that says, I am undone. We're like Paul that says, I'm a wretched man. We're like all of the prophets who realize, I cannot do it. We need a righteousness. And it's not going to be our own. It can't be our own. Because we're tainted by sin. But there's beauty in this scripture, Romans 8. God done what the law could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order. Look at that part. In order that the righteous requirement of the law may be fulfilled. What does Jesus say in John, what we just read, Matthew I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill it. Glory goes to God. Hebrews 10, 1 through 7. It says, For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continuously offered every year, make perfect those who draw near otherwise they have they would have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sin but in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sin every year for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin consequently when Christ came into the world he said Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, I have come to do your will. O God, as it is written for me in the scroll of the book. Amen. So, what I was saying earlier, how everything is is pointing you to Christ. The perfect life, the righteousness, the holiness, everything was pointing you to Christ. Even these sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, it says, can never take away sin. But when Christ came, it says that he offered a sacrifice once for all time and he sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. So he was that perfect lamb. He was the one to do all these things. Romans chapter 4, verse 4 through 5. It says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but what is due. And to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him as righteousness. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake... For our sake he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. So everything that was required and demanded, God provided in his son Jesus Christ. Girls, look at how amazing that is. If God, since God is holy and he demands perfection and we're not perfect, we're not, we're not good. There is no one on earth who does good and no one sins, Ecclesiastes says. Romans 3 says no one is good. No, not one. All of us have turned aside. We have gone our own way. All of our righteous deeds are filthy rags. Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 7 says that the mind set on the flesh is hostile to, to God. It does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot submit itself to God's law. But look at what Jesus says. 
I have come to do your will. It is my food to do your will. It is my pleasure to do the will of the Father. What all of us had no desire to do, we were full of sin, had no righteousness to account for. Even what we think we could have is not good enough. Christ comes and he is called the righteous one. And he comes and takes our place on the cross. Not only takes away our sins, but he also gives us the righteousness that we can never earn. We need it not only to be wiped clean from our sin, but we need it a righteous account. And Christ gives us that righteous account once we put our faith in him according to uh, Romans chapter 4. Now to the one who does not... Now to the one who works, again, it says, his wages are counted as a gift, but is not, is not accounted as a gift, but what is due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him as righteousness. Amen. Hold on, Candy, you're doing a great job. If I were going to do that, I would always do Glory goes to God. Stephanie, I feel like I'm all over the place. Uh, but do you see, when Jesus says, you must be perfect, he's not saying, try your best, live, don't sin, don't do this, don't do that. Just try your best. God is not saying that. He's, he, he's lifting the bar. He's going more. No, you must be perfect. And he, not, he gives us the perfect Christ while we were enemies of God, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 says, while we were helpless, Christ came and died for us. While we were enemies, while we were sinners, hostile to God, Christ did this for us. So I hope that this makes sense to you girls, that when we hear Try your best, that our best isn't good enough. This is why we need to understand the holiness of God, that trying your best makes it seem like God is, uh, all right, give me what you got. All right, what do you got? All right, that'll work. No, God is demanding perfection, but he also supplies perfection in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. First Corinthians 1.30 says it's because of him God the Father, that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let no one who boast, let, let the one who boast, boast in the Lord. So in Christ, we have righteousness, we have, this is saying, redemption, through his blood and wisdom and sanctification in Christ, not on our own. So on that day of judgment, when we stand before God and he, if he was to ask us, why should I let you in? What righteousness do you have to account for? We are to say, I myself have nothing. I am a sinner. I was born into iniquity and sin. All of my righteous deeds are filthy. I have nothing to say here. Here's my best. But I don't stand here on my own righteousness. I stand here because of your son, because of his righteousness, because of his account. I have nothing to offer God but a filthy rag. But Jesus, he is the one that offers perfection. Amen. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says that God was pleased to crush him and to put him to grief that he was pleased with the sacrifice. This is why uh, God raised him from the dead. The resurrection is a big part of it too. Because if Christ wasn't risen, that means that God wasn't pleased with the sacrifice. But since God raised him from the dead, that shows that he was pleased with the sacrifice. God is demanding a perfect sacrifice, a perfect righteousness. And he supplies it in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So it is because of God that we are even in Christ Jesus, who became for us righteousness. Amen. So 
glory goes to God for that. Galatians 2.21, I'll end with the scripture. It says, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. If we could try our best, if we could achieve this, then we didn't need Christ because then we could be our own savior. If the message we're hearing today, try your best and hopefully it'll work out, that's not going to do us any good. We need a perfect righteousness. We need a lamb without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And God provides that. We don't even provide that. God is the one who gives it so that we could be saved. And God being just, he could justify sinners without him going against his holiness, without him contradicting his other attributes. Because since God is just, the truth is, since God is just, he cannot save sinners. He cannot save us unless there is someone who has a perfect righteousness and bears our sins on the cross. So Christ does both of those things. He fulfills righteousness and he satisfies the wrath of God. Glory goes to God for that. So I pray that whenever we hear that, try your best type message that we would say or that we would be reminded of our best is not good enough. God is demanding perfection, but he also supplies perfection in his son, Jesus Christ. So I pray that we would believe that tonight in, or in an order for us to be saved is for us to put our faith in that. Bali, Romans chapter four says, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but it's what is due. If we're trying our best and if we're working, now uh, it's due to us. I'm boogie. Okay, you did this, now it's due for me to give it to you. But it says, but to the one who does not work, which means to the one who's not depending on his works, it doesn't mean he's not doing anything, but it's to the one who's not depending on what he could do but just simply believes and trust to and cling to and rely on the perfection of Jesus Christ. It says that, that his faith is accounted as righteousness. Amen. And as a result, the Bible says when we place our faith in him, that we are saved, that we are considered justified. And he takes our sins as far as the east is from the west. He removes them from us. And that... He loved us while we were sinners, and he sent his son to die for us. So glory goes to God for this. I pray that you girls would be go more deeper into the gospel, go more into the perfect life of Jesus. Notice, girls, how he doesn't sin. Even when he could have fought back and he could have done all of these things, he didn't fight back. There was no deceit in his mouth. There was never no sin. This scripture really amazed me today on uh, how his blood was even unblemished his blood was spotless our blood is tainted by sin but christ's blood is perfect and it's righteous and that is why god could say that he is pleased with him and that he's pleased with the sacrifice and it actually worked so glory goes to god for this wonderful for his wonderful message and i'm just so thankful for the person and work of jesus christ that he is all in all amen God bless you girls. God bless all of you girls. But churches, go more deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really is the power of God unto salvation. This is what we need to hear more. And this message will drive us to want to live and pursue a holy night life. Now that we know that he, he demands perfection and he supplies perfection in his, in his son, Jesus Christ, now we should also walk in him uh, walk as an example what is it first or second peter says that christ left us an example to walk in his footsteps to pursue after righteousness and holiness and to be as christ is amen glory goes to god father i thank you for this night lord i pray that your word went out and it doesn't come back void i pray that it would produce and stir up more fruits of the spirit lord and that you would be lifted up high. I pray that people would tell more of your gospel, Lord. I pray against this 
try your best type of message because your word says that all of our best is filthy rags and it's not enough and people are going to strive and think that they could do it on their own but your word says that if anyone preaches another gospel he is to be accursed so god please protect your sheep from any false gospel lord a gospel that does not save but i pray that people would be bold and have courage to share that the gospel is by faith in your son jesus christ and we give you glory for living the perfect life and taking upon our sins lord and i pray that we would be pleasing unto you thank you for dying for us on the cross and for satisfying the demands of the righteous law lord and i pray that we would walk in it as your word says that we would walk in the law of liberty lord that we would be as your word says in romans that we uphold the law in jesus name glory to you amen amen god bless you girls god bless you gina god bless you sam tiffany stephanie god bless all of you girls i love yous and uh, we'll probably probably be back on in a few days sorry for all of my stuttering and <laughs> all over the place but i pray that this girl that this message blessed you so god good night god bless girls